Building a web-free startup isn't just about writing code, it's about solving real-world problems. In this episode of Dev Diaries, we follow the Freely team as they put their ideas to the test, gathering user feedback and making a crucial pivot towards a more impactful solution. Host St. Joseph knew that for Freely to succeed, it had to solve a real pain point. For their initial focus on remittance payments, they took their prototype to the Philippines, one of the largest remittance markets in the world. The idea? A chatbot that allowed users to send and receive funds seamlessly via Stellar's blockchain. When they put that in front of real users, the feedback was unexpected. People were confused about interacting with a chatbot for financial transactions. Many were reluctant to use crypto for remittances. And traditional remittance methods, while expensive, were still deeply ingrained. The very first thing we did was go over to the Philippines to really see what the competitive landscape was. So from a macro perspective, things made sense. High crypto adoption, growing middle class, very young average age of 24 to 25, made sense that people would want a technology solution for sending money, which accounted for over 8.5% of the GDP of the Philippines. The first meeting we sat down, it was in a Jollibee fast food restaurant, and someone walked through all of the different apps, use cases, and even filled out the whole survey. And not just like filled it in, but walked through why the answer of each question was the way it was. And that was actually what was helpful was getting that conversation going rather than then just clicking the buttons. The next day we went out, we actually ended up having a two and a half hour conversation with just one person who went through every single financial app they use. That's when we kind of brought up the idea of a chatbot and using Telegram and showing them what the flow would be on that. One theme that was common in every single financial app in the Philippines was the level of security and compliance because there's very low income demographics that need their money to be so secure because even if they lose 10 to 20 dollars that might be their money for the first two weeks of the month and when they tried to wrap their head around telegram something that they message with or even facebook messenger or viber as something to use to send money they couldn't wrap their head around it and would immediately shut down the idea and that was when the first initial thoughts of hey is this the right approach to this market because in Mexico someone like Felix Pago really was successful using WhatsApp to send remittances but in the Philippines there's a super app called Gcash where people can send money from abroad to that and be able to send it to MoneyGram to send it to Gcash uh, users in provinces etc which um, was done very efficiently already with the level of security they needed to keep peace of mind. So you were getting the feedback from individual users. Where did the idea to pivot to a business to business system come from? I think this was actually coming from ruling out possibilities. So it actually started as the Telegram chatbot. Then we thought, okay, how about if we just made a bank, like kind of like a wallet? There's Gcash, there's Paymaya, there's so many different ones, and it's all about like differentiating yourself. But we went through a walk through a mall, we went to a vendor stall selling boba tea, and we looked at it and we saw 15 options for different payment wallets. And we said, how do we differentiate? And then to further validate, went, spoke with someone, and they said, yeah, look, I use these wallets to just receive money and then transfer them. And there you don't have economies of scale. You don't make revenue on those small transfers. And so we pivoted from going out onto the field and speaking to, you know, poor rural areas, as well as just the regular like bank and uh, financial app user in the Philippines to talking to business owners and business owners in particular paying out to multiple stakeholders in their company. That's where we saw, hey, like they're really breaking the rules a lot on certain things. Maybe this is something we should look at. So what were the benefits of a payout management system over a financial chatbot product? So the very first conversation we had that really brought this to light was with a social media manager. And basically he managed a content house. So creating TikToks, YouTube videos, etc., with a bunch of different social media influencers living in his house. He was talking about receiving one bulk payment from YouTube or TikTok, whatever platform was providing the money that the people generated, and it would go to his bank account. He would 
manually type in every single bank detail for each one of the like 20 people in his house every single week. It's manual. Um, there's no invoice management. There's no tracking of how that money is being sent out. And it immediately just hit us in the head is that sounds like a problem. And when we were looking at Telegram and the banking, it just kind of felt, felt like we were using a solution that sounded cool, uh, even though we didn't feel the real problem yet. And I feel like standard startup talks, it's all about find the problem, find the problem. And when you started feeling that pull towards, hey, I think there's actually something to solve there. That's why we decided to go into that area more. Sometimes even a well-designed product isn't the right fit for a market. Instead of pushing forwards blindly, they listened to the feedback and made a bold decision. It was time to pivot. Instead of fighting against user behavior, the team decided to lean into it. What if instead of focusing on a chatbot-based remittance model, freely helped businesses and helped automate payouts? This new approach meant that they could target businesses and gig platforms instead of individual users. Focus on payout management for digital workers, freelancers, and businesses. And they still leverage the Stellar stack for instant cost-effective global transactions. The thing about whenever you need to start moving money around, immediately you think about programmable money, which is just like stable coins. My favorite part about the stack and the user we can give it to is the policy signers. And this is how you can just adapt or set specific permissions for your sub accounts within your main wallet. I think the limit is how creative you can get with this permissions. So for instance, if you wanna have everyone on your company have direct access to your wallet, but have different permissions for each of them, then that's something completely doable. The thing about that is that since it's very new, there's still a lot of testing and auditing that needs to be done before we can release that to the public but we can always start playing around with these permissions and, and, and these kind of things. The pivot didn't just make sense for the users, it played into Stellar's strengths. Fast, low-cost transactions, which are ideal for frequent payouts, and anchors for fiat on off-ramps, which makes converting crypto to cash seamless. So this is like a general overview of the freely business banking account. Creating a new account is actually very easy. And this has already the passkey technology integrated. So that's why it's asking for it. And whenever we need to sign a transaction, then this same passkey is the one that's going to be needed for that. It's very, very basic still. We can have like a list of recipients, either business or personal. And to adding a new recipient is just very easy. We try to make this as simple as possible, trying to avoid all of the extra unnecessary details. For instance, here we can just start with the name. Even the email is optional, very helpful, but still optional to make it easier for the end user. Uh, right now we can just transfer to the Philippines, either as a bank transfer, e-wallet, or also to a crypto wallet. The most common there are Gcash, Maya, and directly with coins.ph. For this, they, you just need the phone number of the recipient. So I'll just put some demo information here. Uh, and that's it. Just like that, we have already our users. We're still pending verification for those. But now we are ready to start making the first payouts. Um, this is how it looks to make a payout. We can just select to who we are sending the money. Insert the amount that we are going to be sending. Make sure everything's okay here. We can see it's the e-wallet Gcash, the mobile number that we just added. Uh, we're going to go to our review page. Well, once we confirm the payment, then everything is going to be running in the background. This is exactly where we're at right now. Then we have to orchestrate all of the account movement and the money movement in the background for them. But this is like the ideal flow that we are looking for our users. One of the biggest advantages of the pivot is that it makes Freely far more scalable and viable from a go-to-market perspective. The original remittance chatbot concept would have required direct marketing to thousands of individual users, building trust and overcoming behavioral barriers. This is expensive, time-consuming and challenging in markets dominated by legacy financial institutions. By shifting to a business-focused payout management solution, Freely now has a clearer sales strategy. An enterprise sale model, which instead of convincing individual users, freely can onboard businesses that already have large user bases. These are higher value clients, 
Businesses managing freelancers, payments or payroll have more immediate pain points and budget for solutions. This could lead to faster adoption. Businesses are often more willing to integrate a tool that saves them time and money, especially if it simplifies compliance and treasury management. The biggest difference is it needing to be very manual. So on any given day, there's a lot of meetings with different business owners. And the hard part with these conversations is anytime you brought up stablecoin, blockchain or anything, the whole conversation pivoted to that. What we actually realized needed to happen was having these conversations about just being a financial tool that made your payouts more cost effective, instant and localized without any of the mess that other platforms offer. If we told them the mechanisms that were happening behind it, people just didn't even pay attention to what we what we had to say, any of the values. The whole conversation was just about why crypto was scary, whatever, whatever. So the go to market now, instead of a marketing and going to the masses is very individualistic. It's speaking to people, tailoring our solution to fit their necessary narrative as much as possible, trying to give them the security that we're the right solution. This is the kind of thing where one meeting can make a massive difference, whereas before you would need to market it to thousands of users, whereas now a single client could bring in thousands of existing users. Does that provide more realistic potential upside for the project? I think that was the one of the biggest appeals as well, was when you hear someone say they have a problem, you know you're building it for them. And knowing they have that problem, you know other people are going to have it. And then it's about a matter of getting as many people using your solution so that you build the trust, which is a key factor in the Philippines in particular, to work with slightly larger businesses and then slightly larger businesses. When we were looking at the go-to-market for just like a Telegram chatbot, it's all about economies of scale and reaching the masses and putting something that gets ingrained into everybody's daily lives. And that was a very difficult, especially when you consider the regulations in the Philippines um, in terms of the amount of money needed to be invested, as well as the level of liquidity we would need. Pivoting isn't just a business decision, it's a technical challenge too. The shift to payout management meant reworking key parts of Freely's application from the ground up. Um, actually, the approach that we were following at the very beginning, it was not directly to just start and build everything into a single application, but rather I had a like a separate project where I can just build and test things out very quickly. So that's where I started playing around with pass keys and policies and then just regular stellar transactions. By the point we were discussing about the pivot, we were still in like in the initial design step. So there was not a lot of development that was already very, very custom for the remittance and chatbot thing rather than what already was done for the hackathon. So then it was, I think it was a good thing that we did it this way. Do you have any advice for other developers and founders that are working in Web3 and trying to find product market fit? Hardest part is just needing to make sure you're speaking to customers. And I think Jose and myself can be a testament to diving down so many rabbit holes along the way. Like even in this conversation, it sounds like, oh, we went from Telegram chatbot to potentially a bank to payouts management. And I couldn't explain how it doesn't feel that it was just that smooth. It was, you know, Jose building out full front ends, myself diving into all the regulations that would be needed when in reality, all we needed to do was speak to as many people and find problems. And without that, I feel like you shouldn't even be coming up with the product yet. If anything, it should just be coming up with the way to test that problem to make sure other people have it what we kind of felt the pull towards doing and then something we have just started doing a bit more as we've progressed and still doing to this day trying to figure it out. That makes sense. I've been guilty of this in the past as well. My comfort zone is in my office writing code and actually getting out and speaking to people as an introvert developer can be quite difficult. You end up building something which isn't in line with what real users actually want. Any other final thoughts and advice on user validation? I would just say like the ability to have the idea and then move forward seemed like one of the strengths that Jose and I just needed to learn very quickly. Like the, the first idea lasted, I think, way longer than it should have. And then by the time we 
finished our time in the Philippines and, and you know, now even working remotely. Okay, listen to customers and process what they need and see where what direction that should be pulling you while still having conviction that the technology and the base should be the same. Web3 development isn't just about decentralization, it's about building tools that users actually want. If you're interested in building Web3 products, there's a tutorial in the description which demonstrates how to build a landing page for product validation using the Web3 backend. By embracing user feedback, the 3D team evolved their product into something with real market demand. The 3D story is a lesson in adaptability. Listening to users led them to a better, more scalable solution, and one that leverages the power of stellar smart contracts and decentralized finance. But the work isn't done yet. In the next episode, we're going to dive into the technical heart of 3D's payout system. Stay tuned.